Okay, while we're um, preparing here, are there any questions about uh, any of the lecture material or the labs? Lab two is due today for the Monday group. Um, my partner and I did have a question about lab two, but we were wondering if we could bug you during office hours. Please. Yeah, that works too. Yep, so I have office hours right after class. Okay, there's Julie. Okay, Julie, I've made you a co-host, so if you can admit people in the waiting room when they show up. Yeah, I'll keep an eye on it. Okay, thanks. Okay, so this, uh, today we're, we're continuing our lecture from Wednesday on model selection. So the idea behind model selection is, let me see if we're recording, yep, okay. The idea behind model selection is when we're trying to think about what affects a population, we can hypothesize a lot of different things. So we talked to this about this a little bit with the elk population and what drives population. It's more than just time and random, random change. It's things like uh, disease, predator populations, precipitation, habitat. All of these things may or may not affect the population. We think that they may be related to some of some of those covariates. Um, and we want to collect data to see if they are related, if they are correlated. But we have a lot of different hypotheses. When I was talking about the elk, the elk uh, example, I just mentioned three or four different hypotheses. Well, it could be habitat. It could be precipitation. It could be the predators. Um, what was the other one? It could be disease. It could be one of these things, or it could be all of them. And we want to figure out which, which model best predicts it. So of those four things that we are, are, are hypothesizing could affect the elk population, um, which one's most supported by the data and which one helps us best predict the population. And we're going to use model selection to choose the model that is going to um, give us the best predictive ability. And we started talking about AIC and Akaiki's information criterion right before we finish class. So this, this lecture is about AIC and how we're gonna use AIC to choose a model. And the nice thing is it's simple. AIC gives us a number and the lowest number wins. So the only, what we need to do is understand what goes into that number. So let me share my screen here to my lecture slides. Week four, lecture six. Uh, the lecture slides are posted online. The solutions to lab one are posted online. I'll post the solutions to lab two after lab today. And Julie is uh, in the process of grading labs one and two. You may have heard back from lab one already. Okay, here we go. Okay, I also, all the labs are graded for lab one. So if you, if you don't have a grade, it's because I don't have a lab one from you. Okay, thanks Julie. All right, so this is our second lecture on model selection. We're gonna get into AIC and why it's such a nice tool. So AIC is called, uh, first let's talk about um, what, we, what we're expected to know from this lecture. Uh, how to conduct model selection using AIC. In terms of the linear models we've talked about already, it's simple, we, we have capital A, that we have an R command called AIC with all capitals, and then we put in the model the object that we saved our model as, and it'll give us a number. And we do that to all of the models that we're considering, and the lowest number is the best model. Um, so in terms of implementation, it's very easy and straightforward. And this is one of the reasons why it's become so widely used in wildlife science. All right, so the other learning objective is we wanna be able to interpret what AIC values are, 
what delta AIC values are, this, this triangle here is a delta, a capital uh, delta symbol, um, delta AIC values and model weights. We want to know, be able to figure out how many parameters there are in linear regression models. Basically, we count up the betas and then we add one for the sigma squared. And then we want to describe the support from the data for each model by using model weights. We will talk about model weights in lab three. Model weights are basically, think of a piece of pie, how much of the pie each model gets. Model weights have to sum up to one, so, so each model gets some proportion of that one, some proportion of the pie. And if a model has a big proportion of the pie, it's a, it's a, a lot better than the other models. If you have two models that have about equal proportion, then both models may be pretty good. All right, so AIC stands for Akaiki's Information Criterion. This came from a paper in 1973 uh, where Akaiki published this paper and he introduced this number for scoring models. That number has had huge impact on all fields of science for the purpose of model selection. Originally, uh, when he wrote the paper, he called it AN, an like AN, AN information criterion instead of Akaiki's information criterion. But now it has um, evolved and to be, be known as Akaiki's information criterion. There are a lot of information criteria available. Um, some form of IC. Uh, there are there are about ten different information criterions that all have some acronym like this. AIC is the most widely widely used, but there's something called the uh, the deviance information criterion DIC, the Bayesian information criterion BIC, the Watanabe information criterion WAIC. Um, yeah, those are the five I can think of, and they're all used for for scoring models. So this idea of choosing models from a set of models uh, is, is a very common challenge in statistics. And I'm going to, um, let's see. I'm gonna take a screenshot here. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that, okay. I'm going to continue. All right, so we have uh, AIC is an information criterion we're going to use, and AIC is nice because it's simple and it makes sense intuitively. It can be broken down into simple parts. So here's what the equation for AIC looks like. The first part, this negative two um, log likelihood is the most complex part. And then we have the 2K, that's the simple part. This equation can be broken down into two components as, a, as mainly a heuristic. The first part is model fit. This represents how well the model fits to the data. What do we mean by model fit? Well, if we think of the ELK data where we had a straight line trying to fit through the line, let me pull up those slides from lecture one, because I think that's a good example. Uh, let's see, where we go. Here we go. Right here. Okay, can you see that slide? Okay, yeah. Model fit is basically how well this line fits to the points. And we see here, um, maybe this line doesn't fit these data so well because there's a bunch up here. If we had like a bendy line or a wiggly line that was able to move through these lines better, um, the model would fit the data much better. So model fit describes if you think of it like, like in terms of points and a line, how well that line actually represents 
the data. All right, so we talked about um, mod, uh, we talked about increasing model complexity. How might we make this model fit the data better? And I'm going to pick on someone who doesn't isn't showing their screen here. So Jevin, what do you think? Can you repeat the question? Yep. The question is, we have a model here, and this line, this salmon-colored line is going through the, uh, is our model fit? We have these, bend, we have these dots that are, are kind of all over the place, and the, the line doesn't really go through the dots very well. So we talked about one way to uh, improve model fit for this model. Uh, do you recall what that is? No. Okay. Uh, do, okay. Go um, ahead. Didn't we do, we did like two or three lines instead of just one? Kind of. Yeah. Um, we could do two or three lines. Is this what the model we did polynomials with? Yep. So that's what I was, that's what I'm thinking. How do we do, uh, how do we increase model fit? Well, we can, we can add a polynomial here. So we could square X and use that as a covariate and um, that'll fit the, will give, allow us the line to be more wiggly and um, fit these data better. What we could do also is do a huge polynomial. We could say beta zero plus beta one X plus beta two X squared plus beta three X to the third plus beta four X to the fourth. And this line is gonna, very closely track these points. Okay, so we can make our model super complex by making a huge polynomial. Where's my screen? Okay. And and um, we could actually, if we include enough covariates, if we raise x to the high enough power we can get this line to go through every single point. Now, why wouldn't we do this? So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll open this to the floor first, then I'm gonna pick on people who aren't sharing their screen. Okay, so why, why wouldn't we do this? Or why might it not be a good idea to develop a model that goes through every single point, that is flexible enough to go through every single point? This may be a completely new concept. Um, well, I think one thing is at least in nature, not every single point is going to fit a path. I mean, you're always going to have outliers in your data. You shouldn't want everything to fit. You should want to find the trend more than you want to find um, it to go through the point, every single point on that line. Yeah. I think I see what you're saying. So you, um, there should be some, we don't want to be too specific. We don't want to we skew don't the wanna, data. Yeah, so we don't want to be, we don't want it to go through the line. Well, so what was it about skewing the data? What was that comment? Um, Can you follow up on that a little bit? Sure. But um, I guess one thing in data, you're, sometimes you have this really far outlier that's this really odd case. And if you add that in, you're going to skew your data to be what it shouldn't be. And so that's going to be a problem if you include every point. It's going to also skew one direction when it really shouldn't be. Oh, uh, yeah. Skew your model to the data. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I think you're on the right track. Let me um, give an example. Let me plot this here by going to the whiteboard. Where did I go? Not whiteboard.
There we go. Okay. Okay. All right. So I have um, elk data counts and I have year on the bottom. Now we have data that looks something like, let me find that plot. That looks something like this. Right now we have a single line through here and the equation for a line is mu equals beta zero plus beta one X. Uh, all right, we can make this line here more wiggly basically by saying if we say plus beta two X two, now that's gonna give us a polynomial that would give us something that looked like this. If we said, uh, add another one, beta zero plus beta one xi one plus beta two xi two plus beta three xi three. We square that, we cube this. That's gonna allow us to get three bends in our line. If we have it raised to the fourth power, that'll give us four bends in our line. So now we could do something like that. And we can add polynomials. We can make this model as complex as we want with as many parameters as we want. So eventually it has enough lines. Let me make a different color here. It has enough lines to fit through every single data point. And that's model complexity. So we can make this as complex as we want. We can add as many parameters as there are data points and it'll fit exactly. And the question was, why don't we want it to do that? And I think what, uh, what Brittany was getting at was that, well, maybe these data, we don't want a model to reflect these data exactly because, I'm sorry, Brianna, not Brittany. Sorry, Brianna. Okay, we don't want it to reflect these data exactly. We don't want a model that looks like this because we're interested in some underlying trend that's available. This, this model is nice because it explains the data completely. However, it doesn't really do that much for us. We can't really, if we wanna try and predict our, the elk population in the next year, this thing, we don't, it's very unlikely that this is gonna to be too useful. It's too complex and it's, it doesn't give us the overall general trends that are going on in the system for the elk population. So this is model complexity, how, how basically how wiggly our line is, if we're thinking in one dimension. Um, and this is a super complex model and we don't always want a complex model. So Einstein said, make everything as, what is it? As simple as possible and no more complex than that, something like that. We want everything to be, well, let me just Google it. It's this idea of Occam's razor. Why can't I get a Occam's razor where we want things to be as complex as possible, but no more complex. And I wanna know what that saying. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And that's what we wanna do with our models. And this is called the principle of parsimony. So AIC gives us a way to make models as simple as possible, but no simpler. It's gonna try and capture the important trends in our data and not overfit our model to uh, needless noise that we see in our data. So let's go back to our lecture slides.
having all kinds of challenges with Adobe today. There it is. Okay. All right, so we can break AIC down into two components. Model fit is how well the line actually represents the data. Model complexity is a penalty for how many parameters are in our model. So AIC balances how well the model fits the data with how complex the model is. We want AIC to be small so if we add parameters, if K describes the number of parameters, if we add parameters to the model, it's gonna make AIC bigger. So as we make our model more and more complex with more parameters, this AIC score is gonna get penalized by adding a parameter. And the likelihood describes how well the data fits the model. And we take negative two times the log of the likelihood both for uh, the negative two is for uh, historical reasons and the log is for computational reasons. Any questions about this? Okay. So this is principle of parsimony, a trade-off between model fit and model complexity. We don't wanna overfit our data because we wanna figure out what the underlying ecological trend is. But we want a model that's useful in prediction. And the model with the lowest AIC is the best approximating model of the unknown reality that generated the data. So let's go back to our bird species richness data where we had linear regression models where we had the mean or the expected value mu described by these eight potential models. We thought all of these three covariates could influence the number of species in any state. We have area, temp, and preset. And we also have different combinations of these models here. So if we have three covariates, there are eight potential models we can consider. We also talked about our null model uh, which represents basically even simpler than simple linear regression. It's just an average of the Y data. And so we have all these hypotheses of what's driving species richness. And we want to choose which hypothesis is best. Which hypothesis do our data support? And this is different than this whole approach of choosing multiple, the method of multiple hypotheses and choosing the best model best hypothesis using AIC is a lot different than what you have seen in the past. So you may have seen things like developing null and alternative hypotheses. This has some relationship to that, but it's a different paradigm. The method of multiple hypotheses is different than choosing a null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis as we would do if we had an experiment. And the reason why this works for wildlife and why it's so popular in wildlife is because we can so rarely have an experiment when we have wildlife data. Okay, in fact, um, the, the American Statistical Association, the ASA, uh, wrote a paper on the, on the uh, why you should be really careful using null hypothesis testing um, when you don't have experimental data because of it's it can be used improperly so many times. So rarely do we see null hypothesis testing in wildlife ecology despite learning about it in introductory statistics classes uh, and other wildlife classes. This method of multiple hypotheses is a much more prominent paradigm. And David Anderson, um, who, who is the champion of this, this AIC and multiple hypothesis testing, has, has a web, uh, had a website, he died this year. Um, ha, well, he still has a website, describing why, why null hypothesis testing isn't such a good idea. And I'm gonna post those papers on, on Web Canvas uh, so you can read through and learn why maybe null hypothesis testing 
isn't such a great idea in some cases. All right. So anyway, we can conduct AIC. Now, how we actually calculate AIC, we uh, this happens in R in the background. We don't necessarily need to worry about calculating negative two times the log likelihood. Um, we can calculate this part easily. We just multiply two times the number of parameters. So we should be able to do this by hand. However, this is a little more complicated and we need computation to do this. Uh, so we can look at these values and we see that temp and precip has the smallest AIC value. Now in lab two, I asked, one of the questions was, um, which model would you choose? It was actually just among these three parameters. Which model would you choose to make inference about the population? The one with area, the one with temp, or the one with precip? We were only looking at simple linear regression in that case. Uh, so we only had these three models. Um, but there was no right answer for lab two because we hadn't talked about AIC yet. But what that question was doing was leading at, if we have these three different models, which one are we actually going to choose? And of these three, uh, precipitation had the lowest AIC, AIC value, 555. We see 559 is bigger than 555. Uh, 560 is bigger than 559. All right, so one thing to note is that AIC values are only relative to each other. There is no absolute score on how good a model is compared to all other models that we could have considered, but that we can only score these models based on comparing each of them to each other. So it's a relative measure. And what that means is our best model is only as good as the model in the models we consider. And if we don't consider a model, we can't compare it, its AIC values to the other models. Here are some notes on interpreting the results. When we have AIC values that are very close together, for example, temp and precip, and uh, area temp and precip. The AIC for area temp and precip is 540. The AIC for temp and precip is 539.9. These are one tenth apart. When we have them that are very close, we have to make some choices. And here are some notes on interpreting these models based on these choices. Models with a delta AIC unit that's greater than 10, so if you go back and look here, if this delta AIC is greater than 10, like this model, this model, this model, this one, this one, and this one, those models have virtually no support from our data. Models with a delta AIC unit greater than four but less than seven have considerably less support than our best models. And was there a question? Okay. And models with delta AIC units less than two are considered to have substantial support and should be used for making inference. So if we have two models that are close together and delta AIC less than two, we should consider those um, in our choices when we're making inference. Okay. So now we see uh, temp and precip and temp area and precip. These have delta AICs less than two. We might we can see that both temp and precip are important because they're in both of these models. But this area one we might consider is area really if we also if we consider temp and precip should we also consider area at the same time because when we look at the AIC score it's pretty close. All right, so a rule of thumb, all models with two delta AIC units of top within the top model are considered competing models and should be considered for making inference. You should at least discuss them if you're uh, writing a report about the data.
All right, so model averaging. We, we talk about model averaging in lab three and we go through the calculations for making this table. This describes how much of the pie each model gets. This is a calculation to describe that. Model weight can be calculated as measures of support for each model in the candidate set. So this tells us the proportion of the pie that each model is going to get. Models with more portion of the pie get, have more support and should be considered. These AIC weights, so this W value are called the weights, they describe the strength of evidence that each model is the best. There's something called model averaging. This was a big field in the 90s. Uh, it's uh, and it's, it's becoming big in something called Bayesian inference. We're going to talk less about uh, model averaging, but it might come up in the future as we do add more and more complexity. Okay, um, a way of doing model selection in the past was something like uh, a stepwise regression and uh, forward stepwise regression, backward stepwise regression. And essentially what they did was with stepwise regression, they would take the most complex model, or they would take the most complex model, being the one with the most, most parameters, um, and they would do a regression analysis. They would see which one of these parameters, beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3, was significant. And if one wasn't significant, they would remove that model from consideration. So let's say area wasn't significant. So let's try the model without area. And then we'll do that regression again. So we'll just do temp and precip. We'll look at the significance of that model. And then we will um, go through, and then we'll see, uh, then we'll see if these parameters are significant. If they are, we'll keep them in the model. If they aren't, we'll remove them. So I can do a, a quick demonstration of, of that, of what that looked like in the past. Let's see, yep, I got my bird CSV file. I'll pull up an R, R file just to show what that looks like. Let me share my screen. Before we move on, are there any questions? Uh, yeah, I have one. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to confirm. So uh, when you're doing, when you're checking for the AIC, the biggest thing that you want to look for is just uh, that delta AIC number being less than two. That's what we should be looking for only. Yeah, if you're fortunate enough to have a delta AIC value, uh, well, the, the, the top model is going to be zero. The delta AIC for the top model is going to be zero. Mm -hmm. And so we'll cover that in lab three. But if you are fortunate enough to do analysis and the second best model has a delta AIC greater than two, it makes things easy because now you're done. You have your top model. You don't have to consider other models. Uh, and you can only make, you only have to make inference on that best model. The other ones, the best one is so much better than the other ones. You don't have to worry about them. Okay. It becomes Thanks. more complicated when that delta AIC value uh, is is less than two, then you have to make considerations for that other model. Okay. So let me go to this. Are there any qu other questions? Let me go to our studio then. And we will load in our birds data. I store the birds data on my desktop. Y, uh, y equals data SPP. Area equals data. Area. I'm just subsetting the data frame. Okay, let's do um, model selection. So we have. 
just say M1. We'll start with the most complex model. Y tilde area plus temp plus preset. So there's our most complex model. So if I do summary M1, now this is called reverse uh, reverse stepwise model selection. And this is what sometimes people do instead of AIC. So we fit our model, it's our most complex model. We have these three, actually if you wanted our most comp, no, that is our most complex model here. Uh, we can look at these parameters here. Uh, we have our estimates down in the console. Let me make this a little bigger. Estimates down here. And there's this uh, p-value here. And what it said, what this says is if there's asterisks here, the, the um, parameter value is different than zero, it's significantly different than zero. It's 95% confidence interval doesn't overlap zero. So we talked about this in previous lectures when we were talking about uncertainty. So this doesn't overlap zero. If you if you uh, take this value and then add and subtract uh, 1.96 times this, it's not going to cover zero. And that's what these asterisks are telling us. So this says, this one doesn't overlap zero, so that's important. This one doesn't overlap zero, so this one's important. So let's keep temperature and precipitation in our model. And we're going to now consider only temp and precip. We're going to get rid of area. So now let's say model two equals linear model y tilde temp plus precip. There's our second model. Let's take a look at this model. And now we have two covariates in here. We got rid of area because it, it wasn't uh, significant in our previous one. These are both significant. We have asterisk, asterisks next to them. So we're going to keep them. And now we're done. That was stepwise regression. Uh, that's not what we're going to do in this class. And there's some reasons why we won't do that. One is that all the models that we have to consider have to be nested with each other. Let's see, okay. All of our models have to be nested, meaning they have to be some subset of our most general model. AIC, we don't have to do that. We can consider non-nested models. Let's see, yeah, models do not have to be nested, but, uh, the, but one thing we do have to do with AIC, they all have to be based on the exact same data set. All right, so the next, the next consideration, the response variable distribution must be identical across the model set. That means they all have to come from a normal distribution if we're using linear regression. And we're gonna talk about, when we talk about generalized linear models, they all have to be either Poisson, uh, negative binomial, and so on. If we're using AIC, we'll come back to this point as we learn more about these types of models. What does it mean for the models to be nested? The models to be nested means if we go back to our uh, R Studio code, am I? Uh, that's this is working right. Uh, okay. All right. If we go back to, oh no, that's not right. My screen sharing is giving me all kinds of problems. There we go. All right, nested means we're going to start off with our most general model here, area, temp, and precip. It means that all of our subsequent models have to include these pieces, area, temp, and precip. So any of the ones that I'm considering have to be basically built out of these building blocks. So I could choose area, area and precip, area and temp, um, just area, just temp, or just precip. 
but it has to consist of these building blocks. It means I can't consider a model like uh, M9 equals linear model of Y tilde area plus area squared plus uh, temp plus precip because area squared is not a part of these components. I could make this my most general model and then this model would be nested within this model. It means that all, there's, there, okay, is that clear? It's like you have yeah, building blocks, sense. okay. You have the most complex set of building blocks and then you have other models that are a subset of that. So if you were to use area squared on your first one, would, would using it later still be nested? Yeah, if you have one general complex model that includes all the sub pieces, uh, then you can build smaller models based on that one. But there are circumstances where you could add something to one model like a temp plus, uh, I don't know, predators, where predators isn't in our most complex model. That's not nested in there. It means if we start off with, if we start off with our most complex model here, that we can we we can get rid of one of these. It'll still be in here in this. We can just get rid of one and then that one will be nested within this one. Okay. So returning to the lecture slides. Models comparing an untransformed to a trans response variable cannot be directly compared uh, via VIC. We're going to talk about transformations later when we get into generalized linear regression, but that's like if you take the log of the response variable. All right, so why is all this important? We often have lots of data on covariance we think might be important to an ecological process of interest. Not all of these covariates are going to help us predict the future. Not only the future, but if we're doing this in space and we have data at an un unobserved location, what can we predict about that location? So when we were talking about the species richness data, maybe we don't have data for uh, for one of the states and we wanna predict how many birds are there. Um, not all of those covariates might help us predict how many birds are there. We wanna choose the ones that are most important in doing so. Model selection gives us a formal method for identifying the most important covariates to use in our model. And then we can use the results of model selection to identify what covariates are important for wildlife management and conservation. So here's a, an exercise. Um, we have five minutes, we can talk about this. We have Henslow Sparrow count data following prescribed fire at 20 grasslands. We also have data on grassland size, time of burn, habitat fragmentation, and woody encroach encroachment. So using statistical notation similar to what we've discussed today, develop a set of candidate models to examine the relationship between Henslow Sparrow counts and other covariates that might affect the response. So why don't I give you a few minutes to write out uh, three different potential models that we might consider, uh, write these out in proper statistical notation, and then I'll come back and, and I'll call on someone at random, see if anyone's not sharing their screen. Oh, uh, there's a few still. Okay. Jevin, you're off the hook because I already called on you on this one, on my last one. Brittany, Kayla, Shyla, Jackson, Jacqueline. Okay, so right, work on that exercise and then we'll discuss this when we have just a couple minutes left.
a uh, quick question. Yeah. Um, so, like, is the like the grassland size, the time bur like of burning, the fragmentation and the encroachment, are those supposed to be like, kind of like the the pre the preset temp and area? Yeah, those uh, are the covariants. That's right. Okay, cool. So then, um, like, is it basically? Um, how am I trying to word this? So basically, all like we you're basically wanting us to do is just plug those in um, to where like area temp and preset would normally be. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And develop a set of develop a set of three models, three different models from those covariates. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. All right, let's um let's see. How about Jacqueline? Jacqueline, what do you think? Um honestly, I'm not 100% sure I am not super great with writing. That's all right. We'll work through this. Let me uh, share my screen here. Well, it's, I can share the whole desktop. Oops. We have just two minutes. Okay. So the question was, we have some covariates that it gives us. Let's write out some models that we're going to consider. Um, we we have Hensel spiral counts. For now, we're going to use Y on those. So we say our data Y. Um, we'll say equals beta zero. We always have beta zero plus beta one. Now we're entering a covariate. So what do we have for our covariates? And this is what Ian was talking about. We have grassland size, time since burn, habitat fragmentation, woody encroachment. So let's just say grass, time, frag, and wood. So we could develop a really complex model that says grass plus time plus um, frag. Plus wood. There's our most complex model, right? Then we have epsilon i for our errors. Epsilon i comes from a normal with mean zero and variance sigma squared. Okay. Oops. Now, if we wanted to um, develop another model, let's call this mu and model. This is model one. Our second model, we could say model two. Now maybe we don't think wood, uh, wood, woody fragmentation is so important. So we could say mu i equals beta zero plus beta one grass plus beta two time plus beta three frag, right? So now we have two models we can compare. And basically with these two models, we're saying What's the importance of wood in this most complex model? I'm out of time now, um, but that's the idea. Now you could imagine how we go from this complex model and just develop different subsets for all of these different models and develop, I think, 16 total different models to compare in our hypothesis. All right, so we'll pick up on this. This is our last slide. Uh, we can come back to this for a moment, just as a recap on Wednesday. Uh, we have lab today at, at 2.30 to 5.15, and then I have office hours right now if you have any questions. So if you have any questions, um, send me an email, a quick email, uh, about something you want to see covered in class. If something's uncertain, 
some of these topics don't quite seem familiar, send me an email and I'll put a little emphasis on, on that topic and review that in class. We want to solidify some of this information. One last comment. This idea of model selection and building these models is not unique to wildlife ecology. These tools apply to all fields of science. So what you're learning now is not just uh, applicable to wildlife ecology, but you can use this in anything. You can use it on the data you collect in your personal lives uh, to try and examine relationships and see what's important and not. Widespread applicability. All right, thank you.